Yeah. Okay. Well, Amiti is here. Thank God for that. Um, I know. I. You know what? I'm not used to this Zoom and stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm we use Google Hangout a lot more, so I've yeah. been to the Zoom meetings here, but messing around. They told me don't touch it. I felt I'm a baby now. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's all okay it's all okay so um i'll start the session i know we, we i think we started a little bit late so we might have a little bit of a leeway and like do more but i'll in quickly introduce myself i'll go over the time and like what we're gonna do in the next 20-ish minutes and then um and then i'll introduce Miti, and then he's gonna take it from there so um hello everybody my name is tushita i am a 2014 shulik leader from university of saskatchewan I graduated in a degree in computer science and statistics, and I currently work as a software engineer for a startup company. So I'll quickly give a rundown of the session. Um, the session was supposed to be about 25 minutes. I'm not sure about how long it is going to be now, but um, Métis will be talking to us about his experiences in tech entrepreneurship for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have questions for question and answer session for 10 minutes. So if you do wanna ask questions, maybe like pop some signal in the chat saying that you're interested, I'll probably be um, um, going over them as a first come first serve basis. So, um, okay. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce Miki today. He is driven by the belief that education is a right and not a privilege. He is a co-founder and chief marketing officer at Apply Board. He leads the international recruitment, partner relations, sales enablement, sales operations, and marketing teams along a shared mission to educate the world. That is a handful of roles. Um, as a former international student himself, Métis empowers his teams to support students along their educational journey by delivering an exceptional customer experience and continuous innovation. Since co-founding Apply Board in 2015 with his brothers Martin and Masi Basiri, Métis has been instrumental in building long-standing relationships with over 1,500 of best educational institutions across Canada, the States, the UK, and Australia, and over 7,500 global recruitment partners. Um, Amiti was also honored to be recognized by Forbes to, Forbes to be a uh, top 30 in the 30 in three different categories of education, immigrants, and big money. So Amiti, welcome. And um, he'll be talking to us about his journey as a tech entrepreneur in Canada. And I'll uh, leave the virtual stage to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Hope you had a phenomenal day. And uh, so thanks for uh, sharing this story. It's always so interesting when you hear people talk about yourself, you're like too, too much. Uh, you don't feel like, you don't wanna be on a spotlight. You know, you'd rather to just tell the story the, the way that you gone through it. Uh, so about 10 years back, uh, me and my brothers actually came to Canada, a phenomenal country as international student. And uh, so it was a very tough process for, and if anyone in these colleges with international students, they would definitely understand the very uh, challenging process to go from a country to the other country and then learn a language. I couldn't speak a word of English. So you needed to learn a new language. You need to do a lot, the society, everything. So. Uh, longest story short, after going to a school, while, while we were in the school, a lot of family friends were keep messaging us, how did he go, can he help us? So we always were like, for traveling, it's much easier. Why for going abroad, it has to be this lengthy process that takes 12 to 18 months. Why should it be that difficult? And uh, we thought, you know what, after the school, let's just make it a seamless. That's, that's, that's why... Uh, I think like when a problem comes front of you and you can't just find a solution, don't hesitate. You know, if, if someone hasn't done it, uh, you could be the first one. And that's what we did back 2015 in May. We had started, uh, we didn't, I was, I didn't go to a school for computer side. So we had zero lack of tech. We brought a tech co-founder and uh, I, all I knew, I knew how to build website, but I learned it on YouTube. You know, it wasn't meant to go to a school and do it. And, uh, and a lot of things actually, I don't think a school teaches you. A school teaches you to be uh, disciplined. A school teaches you to be 
uh, out of box thinker. They do teach 20, 30 percent of your uh, career, but you learn 80 percent, 70 percent by yourself. You, you can learn much faster. And that's, I'm not saying a school was bad, a school is phenomenal. My life has changed. We're bringing in students to go to a school, but I think it's nowadays that everything is just a thing, our, our own fingertip and we can learn everything on our own. We shouldn't have any excuse to not try or do something uh, on our own. Longest story from about six and a half years ago, we have started, it was, impossible, you're not Canadian permanent residency, you're no one really giving you the credibility, how three international students going to do this. That time, six, seven years back, having in a startup in Canada was not an easy fundraising, was not an easy, uh, because Canada, like, there was a lot of money in the States, but not in Canada. Uh, thankfully, in the past six years, so much has changed, you know? As I mentioned, like last year, we were the second unicorn, that ever can, like in the second private unicorn last year that we were. I'm not counting Shopify, they're private now, but, uh, and then the, this year, last time that I checked, we have 13 unicorns. So definitely there is a lot of more amazing startup and the tech companies that has came up. At Apply Board, like you might ask, like, what is exactly Apply Board? I kind of tell the story. It's like helping international students go abroad. That's, that's pretty much it is. It, we make the process simplest, that they can go uh, to a one common application, apply for a different country or different school, and then we help them through the journey. Uh, to the date, almost close to 300,000 students has used our platform, which is phenomenal that you can actually place a lot of our students. And we honestly, like neither three brothers, we had like understanding of, like the, the, the most that we knew about our business was that we were international students at that. We just knew how painful is the process. We didn't know. I never entire of my life worked for someone, never. So I didn't have an experience. I knew how to uh, work with other people, chat with other people, but I didn't have experience of working for someone. But it, it was all learning. And I think that the best teacher for you is yourself. And the, the, if anyone has any idea to start any business, I think it's all persistent. There is, Everyone, when 10 years later, you see someone that is successful, you say, look at that guy is uh, lucky. I don't believe in luck. I believe in persistence. I believe in hard work. And I think anyone does it. And don't be afraid of failure. 2016, we needed to lay off nine people. Why? Because we needed to pivot and we didn't have a right business model. So we pivoted. Now, Five years back after that, we have over 1,400 employees in 40 countries. So don't be afraid of uh, failure. Don't be afraid of changing things. But the biggest thing is I, I think like always is persistence. But I'm not going to come stand here and says three brothers, three co-founders made things happen. No, we have amazing 1,400 people. When you get the chance to work with phenomenal people, you bring amazing talent and they help you to grow and they help you to be better. So that's more of the story. I, I want it to be you and you get to ask question that I can answer whatever comes to your mind. But honestly, don't feel like being entrepreneurs or being like doing something different. It like it needs like a huge commitment. No. And to be honest, this is if I if I ever want to give advice to someone, the younger you are, if you want to be an entre entrepreneur, go to it because you don't have usually as much debt, you don't have family to be worried, you don't have kids to be worried, you can take a lot more risk. You can leave back off your car uh, and take the hardship. But the more that you're getting older, the more commitment you have, the mortgage of the house you have, you have to take a less risk, right? You need to have your full-time job. And as I literally remember back 2015, uh, before we raised our first half a million dollar, we had like $600, $700 bank in our bank account. We didn't even have the next paycheck payroll for the people. But you know what? If I would be now in that situation, perhaps I wouldn't take that risk because you know what? Like as you like age, you take a more precaution uh, decisions rather than when you're younger, like whatever, if it doesn't happen, doesn't happen. So that's more of like the, the story and the journey and advices that I can give anyone. And I, I'm sure 
majority of the folks in this call are my same age group. So I can, uh, I, I can tell if you want to go to that path of entrepreneurship, don't, don't overthink it. Don't, um, don't, don't just start something that you think is a problem and solve it. That's, that's really how the whole system at the end works. A lot of companies became successful. The problem did exist for many years and people are like, wow, why did I not thought about that? So, mm -hmm. so um, thank you for that. Um, you've talked a lot about like a lot of systemic hurdles that you had to face when you were doing your study abroad. Were there any, when you were starting your own company with your brothers? And how did you approach them? I think every day of people's life, there are things that you have to think and make decisions and come up with those challenges. I, I would say like even today, the <clears throat> things are changed. You know, like five years ago, I needed to learn how the hell do I call the school and signing exclusive or sign contract with them because I never done it. Now, Five years later, you have to sit here and say, how the hell do I make a decision that $10 million impact your company? So that day, my biggest challenge was like, oh, I need to figure out the way of signing the contract. Now that challenge is far more. So I think like it really, there, there is, I don't think it's almost, almost six and a half years. I don't think there has been a single day that gone by that I was like, oh, cool. I know it. I figure it out. No, it's consistent learning and process. And I think that's what makes life beautiful. Like I, if you want to just sit and then complain about things that is around you, it's very easy. You're just take a positive attitude toward of it and then you move on, you know? And I, I truly believe that that's life. If there was a very sustainable life with zero challenge, I think that would be so boring to just to me. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, Alexander has a question, seems like. Um, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question? Yes, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Alexander Vikol. I was very in inspired by uh, what you said. I'm trying to get into entrepreneurship as well. I have done so in the past. I talked about it in my short leader application. Uh, I got into like um, some, I guess, uh, Shopify stores, and I'm trying to build like a tech company right now. Um, but my my question is, um, what decisions um, that you think maybe this occurred, maybe this didn't, but what decisions do you think made like the difference in uh, making or breaking uh, the company if those decisions did exist? And uh, what resources do you uh, recommend other aspiring entrepreneurs use in today's day and age? Very good question. And the first one, if you decide to run the company with someone else, date them, not dating them, not date. Know they're the right people. Don't just become too uh, like attached, like let's do it. No, choose the right co-founders. And I think like a, one reason that our hard work is where we are because we truly two brothers, family business is tough, but we trust each other. At the end of the day, when we go, we go to the bottom of everything when you were not going to leave each other. I think that's super important. If you do decide to go, I think that's, a, the, I've seen so many founders collapse together, so many. And usually that's not the good. If you decide to do it alone, I think like rather than whenever you get to roadblock and it happens most likely every week of your journey, and you don't know what to do, which is answered of your second question, just go to your LinkedIn, find people that you think that you should message, send a message. I get a lot of message, hey, Mitzi, I'm trying to do, can I do a coffee or a time? I message people, yeah, if you come back with 10 questions in the call, yes. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people willing to help. We underestimate that how many people are willing to help. I think like there's so many amazing people out there, free resources, all you have to do ask. I learned something and I think that's just because of my more of like sales side of me. If you don't ask, you don't get. That's, that's, a, that, that's the simplest thing. I, when I go in a store or something that I think I can negotiate, it's not that I can't afford something, I ask. I ask because if I don't, yeah, what is it they say no? 
I hear no millions of times in my life, but it's okay if I don't ask what's going to happen. So ask, ask people around, you're going to hear 20 no's, one yes, and that one yes is going to work that 20 no's. And that's in selling, that's in life, that's in a school, that's like I was those students that any class was like, teacher, I have a question. Teacher, I always was asking questions, I was never be afraid of that. Mm -hmm. So you touched a little bit about um, partnering with your brothers. How did that work out with your relation, with your personal relationship with your brothers? And um, is that like how does how do investors perceive it? And how um, how did how did that work out? I'm just curious. Awful investors don't like family business. Some do really like family business because they know the trust. Some actually don't. Usually they. The, the pocket, the bucket of don't is more than the do. Right. Uh, I think we were lucky that we each chose a portion of our power. So we were at the second, the first two, three years, we step on each other very much. So mm -hmm. we learned that we're going to put the line and I'm good at sales and marketing. My twin brother, the other brother, one is good at sell operation and that the other one is good at external and then investor relationship. So we pick it, our area that we wanted to focus and then it, we build trust that it's okay to trust that person gonna make decisions. So I think the perks of it is far more than the cons of it. Having said that it's not easy. Like the, because here's the thing though, I'm just gonna give the example as any. Annie, I don't know her. I would never become like harsh or uh, talk with a different tone because she's a colleague, right? But then if uh, if, if um, brother or sister, you, you, you could be a little bit more aggressive because, you know, at the end, they're not going to be upset. You know, you're the same block. So I think that's, that's what is challenging because you never call, you yell at your colleague or peers. But mm -hmm. your brother and sister, all of us do. Like, who doesn't do it? You know, like I'm not saying you fight in it, but you do argue with your brother and sister <laughs> in terms of life. So, unless you're a single kid. So, right. I feel like Arthur has something to say about that. Do you? <laughs> oh, I actually had a question, but uh, I just wanted to say, like, I know some people ask, like, oh, like, you know, how are you going to respond to Metis? Um, But honestly, like, like when I was 18 or 19, like, I was reading your guys' story and, like, it really inspired me. So I think, you no, know, maybe what's controversial about what I said before about get more experience before you start a startup is because like going through that process myself and like we failed, we didn't become a unicorn. Um, I realized I realized that, you know, for certain things, sometimes like you may want to like just, you know, try a few things first, get some focus before you kind of come back to it. But I definitely see like, um, you know, if you just jump straight into your problem and like try and get to know that really well, like you can also build something really successful that first time. But I do have a quick question and it's about your guys' growth as a company. And I was really curious, what were the key inflection points that helped you grow from your initial, say 10 million valuation to like hundred million? And how was that different from the inflection points going from hundred million to a billion dollars in valuation? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, it's a very good question. So when you're 10, no one cares about your success. They bet in money. It's like a gamble. Right? A lot of investors, like our first round of valuation is 3.5. They just like gambling. It's like they lose money and they make money one in hundred mostly, right? Or seven out of hundred, whatever. Uh, when you come to hundred, you have some good traction. You can share that there is a lot to do. It's easier because you only have to prove that you become a billion dollar and there you go, that's your 10x return. When we becoming like three billion dollar, three point two billion USD, that was the last round, right? Then it's harder because the the, the type of people that you bring, it's not the, they don't want quick return, but they want to see a sustainable business that can continue to generate revenue and the profit, and it can be profitable in future, and then can really be changed. So I think that is the biggest thing: the expectation change very fast. The early investor wants return. The latest stage investors want sustainability. And I think that's why like, you would see, like obviously, there is less risk for people coming at the later stage than the lower. But I think it's a very day and night. Like right now, the company 
growth is the most number important and number things that matter for our power board. But then getting thousand students five years ago compared to hundred thousand students this year, the number doesn't seem like to the eyes of investor much because you're just growing in the scaling of the business. It's like day and night. It's so much harder to get hundred thousand because it's hundred x of what you used to do. So thing like that is the biggest thing. Sustainability becomes a very extremely important. Okay. I mean, okay. that's awesome. Continue. Oh. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I um, so I am being prompted to like kind of wrap up a little bit, but I think we do have time for. Um, did Anish have a question? He did send me a signal, but I'm not sure if that was a question or or um or like a reaction, but um. Or if not, then Kevin can go ahead and ask a question. Uh, all right. First off, thank you so much for coming to speak uh, with us. I found this very informational and I've really enjoyed it so far. Um, my question concerned more around the instincts uh, when you're starting a startup. Um, throughout high school, I, well, I did see a lot of people who were like involved in stuff like that. Um, and as I got exposed a bit more to these people, it kind of felt a bit more robotic. Like there's like certain things that you have to do for a startup. And while I'm sure that there are certain things that are universally um, important uh, 